All right, so I was just, we're just going to say that uh, we, have a <laughs> we have a URL you can visit, and I'm just going to go to that slide, and it'll be, uh, it'll be flickering in and out, but I'm going to tell you what it is as well. And the URL is https console.txl dot rad analytics labs io dot io sorry no rad analytics labs dot io. rad analytics labs dot io colon 8443 and if you can all go to that we'll we'll uh, just get a pdf of these slides from a computer that works with the projector <laughs> yes Co console dot txl dot rad analytics labs io dot io colon 8443, and it's a, it's a secure connection there. Yeah, it, it's got a self-signed assert, so you just have to kind Acknowledge of that you're giving up your personal information to a site that may have been. Labs.io colon 8443, yes. So. Do you want me to plug this in? And uh, yes. And then, do we have that sheet that we can pass around? Yeah. So what we're going to do then is we have some we have some usernames, and the the password is the same as the username, right, Mike? Yes. So you can log into that environment with one of these usernames. So what I'd like to ask people to do this is very high tech and very secure, is to to take a username, log in with it, and then use this pen to cross it off, and then hand the pen and the paper to the next person in the room so that they can do the same. And yes, I was just thinking that would be a, a good thing to do. I just didn't have a spare hand, so I'll do that right now. Do you want me to keep my, did you, are you emailing that thing or? Um, yes, I will. All right, so the URL is, is sort of sideways here, and I'll just pass this around so that, thank you. Yeah, so Mike has it on the screen as well. So I'm gonna send him this deck, and we'll get started. The password is the same as the username in, in each case. And if, if anyone has troubles logging in, just raise your hand and I'll come around and, and help you out. So I'm going to send this PDF of these slides to Mike. So thank you so much for being here this afternoon. We are going to talk about, talk about intelligent applications and containers and why you might want to do that. So I, I, the first thing I, I guess we should mention is that um, it, 
in a in a 90 minute uh, in a 90 minute session we can't we can't cover everything right so we're, we're going to do a little bit of sort of machine learning and containers we're going to talk about why you might why you might care about that it's it's really going to scratch scratch the surface of some things but we're going to focus on a workflow for going from a notebook to an application and sort of arguing for why you might want to do all of those things in containers and Sorry, we're just waiting for an email to arrive here with the PDF. And it's, uh... So when we say intelligent applications, though, we're talking about applications that basically learn from data to get better. The more people use them, and the, the more people use them, right? So with longevity and with popularity, um, you can probably think of example applications that learn from data. Now, the thing we've noticed that's interesting about intelligent applications is that it's not only sort of how people put machine learning into production these days. Uh, machine learning is not just a separate workload anymore. It's also a, really a component of intelligent applications. But it's also, it's also, I think intelligent applications have really driven advances in machine learning as well. Right, so if you think about the last 30 years, there have been a lot of really great research results, but a lot, even really great research results have been driven by application concerns. And the, the goal has not really been so much to like improve the area under a curve as it has been to solve a particular application domain problem. So if we think about things like handwriting recognition, um, image recognition, recommender systems, in all of these cases, we have something that's being driven by application concerns. So here's that URL we mentioned. Um, is everyone ha anyone having trouble getting to that site? Or well, we're done. If you have trouble, just raise your hand, and we'll we'll talk to you about it. Um, but yeah, so uh, again, intelligent applications have really driven advances in in AI and machine learning in the last couple of decades. And if we think about what an intelligent application looks like, we have this sort of basic, you know, we think about the teams that build them, we have this sort of basic workflow, right? Okay, so I'm, I'm hopefully not feeding back anymore. It's, it's, uh, oh, okay. So, if you, th if you think about going from raw data to transformed and federated data, you think about the responsibility of a data engineer, right, whose job is to take a bunch of different data sources, make them digestible to an application, sort of deal with, deal with encoding things, deal with, uh, deal with uh, sort of governance issues, um, th that sort of thing. Um, if you look at someone who's going to take this transformed and federated data and look for patterns with it, figure out how to how to encode objectives as business metrics and, and sort of uh, train models, uh, you're, you're talking about the responsibilities of a data scientist. And then in an intelligent application, you have someone whose job it is to sort of take both of these things and put them together, right? Take the interfaces that a data engineer is providing and the services that a data engineer is providing and take the prototype that a data scientist has developed and put it into production. So that involves sort of maybe scaling techniques up and out, maybe um, monitoring these things at scale, integrating data sources that you have internally with external APIs, and so on. So we can see how it all, all sort of fits together here. The interesting thing is that um, all of these things actually fit naturally in containers. Um, and I'll talk about sort of each of these, each of these components. But if you think about model, model serving, sort of you want to you want to serve a predictive model. That's a stateless thing, right? You can put that in a container. You know, the joke is you could put it behind a Flask application, right? But it could be it could be any endpoint that that sort of holds an immutable model and makes predictions. Uh, our persistent storage is something that's going to live outside of containers, although there are some advances in, uh, in the open source community, like the uh, Strimzy project and like the Rook project for Ceph, that will let you manage messaging, like Kafka messaging or storage, like Ceph object storage, in containers, if, if you prefer to manage things that way. You, you sort of have that option. 
But all of these uh, user interface components are all really stateless commodity things that we can manage as containers. That leaves this sort of compute, compute layer, right? Where we're actually transforming data, federating data, doing, doing feature extraction and model training. And I think for a long time there's been an argument that you sort of need a separate compute cluster to do this, but we're gonna, we're gonna say in this, in this session we're gonna show you how to do it in containers. Um, actually at Buzzwords last year I had a talk where I gave sort of a more detailed argument for why you might wanna do this in containers. We'll get a link up to that um, later so if you, in case anyone is interested in seeing it, but in this we wanna get right to sort of the hands-on part of the uh, workshop as quickly as possible. So in the past, people might have said that we're having a multi-tenant compute cluster and we're also gonna have a sort of application scheduler. But the problem you get into with this is that you're sort of dealing with two separate schedulers that have to cooperate so that if your application is depending on some compute components that they're scheduled at the same time. We've actually found that a better model is to have sort of a logical compute cluster per application. And if you think about the way a framework like Spark or like Flink works, this actually works, works really well because if you, have, if you manage tenancy at the level of, of Kubernetes or of OpenShift or of another container scheduler, then your application components and the compute components that they depend on are gonna be scheduled at the same time. You really care about scheduling your application rather than scheduling a compute job. So I know it's just after lunch. I want to make sure that I'm not, that, I, that I'm making sense, you know? So I'll, I'll, I'll take a minute for questions if anyone has, has questions so far. Anything controversial yet? Anything making sense? Yes, no? All right. So um, to, to look at why compute makes sense actually running in containers, Everyone has, has seen word count in their favorite data processing framework, but if you think about how Spark actually, Spark in particular actually sets this up, you're building a compute graph, you're going through that compute graph, you're scheduling that compute graph onto concrete nodes, and then when you actually have an action, you're actually doing something with it. Well, what does this look like operationally? Um, if you think about what a Spark executor is, it's really just a microservice for data. Your application is gonna send a serialized function to each of these nodes. They're gonna execute it. Because you have a distributed system, you're inevitably gonna have failures. <coughs> Excuse me. And one of those nodes is gonna go away. But because you have this sort of lazy, immutable compute model, you always know how to recompute what you had. So you can rebuild that from nothing when the executor goes away and replace it. So in this way, these Spark executors are really like any other microservice. They're sort of a stateless commodity thing that you can spin up, spin down, and use for your application as, as necessary. Um, so we wanna talk uh, briefly about radanalytics.io, which is our community project that we've built around building intelligent applications on OpenShift, which is, OpenShift is a distribution of Kubernetes. <coughs> Excuse me. And we have tooling to manage Spark clusters, Jupyter notebooks, and we also have TensorFlow training and model serving. But I think the real strength of this community is that we have a lot of example applications. So if you have a particular use case, you can look at those applications and sort of have something that's going to be similar to what you're, what you're working on as a starting point. Um, and so we, we sort of didn't want to just say, you know, you can do this with containers. We wanted to actually show that you can do this in containers. <coughs> we have two different kinds of management tooling for Spark. Again, with this model of having a Spark cluster embedded in an application and managing multi-tenancy at the container orchestration level. The first kind we have uses actually build pipelines. So if you think about an application you have today that has continuous integration and continuous deployment, you wanna put that into production after it's built. 
right? An application passes its test suite, you want to deploy it automatically. We have tooling that will actually take an application that you know depends on a Spark cluster and deploy, deploy the application along with the Spark cluster that it depends on. Uh, the other kind of tooling we have is more for exploratory use. If you want to run a notebook inside, <coughs> inside your container orchestration system, maybe you have sensitive data inside the VPN on-premise or that you have credentials for that data in, in your private cloud account, your public cloud account, and you want to make sure that your data scientist isn't just taking a bunch of data home to run on their notebook, you can also run a cluster that's a Spark cluster for, for that purpose scoped to a particular namespace in container orchestration so that, so that you have access to those credentials and, and those resources. So I think at this point we want to sort of turn it over to uh, looking at actual notebooks. So I, I want to ask if everyone has been able to log into that Is, it, is anybody having issues logging in? Raise your hand. Okay, so. <coughs> Mike, can I just tab to a browser here? Okay. I think just hit escape to go out of the I'll tab back to the browser. And then I think you will this tab. Thanks. And can I just deploy into your project? Yeah, yeah, okay, thanks. All right. So is this font size readable for everyone, even in the back? Okay, so what we have here is this is, this is the OpenShift console. Uh, once you've logged in, you should have a screen that looks like this. Um, if not, you may have to select the project that has your, has your username. So you can select the project that has your username there. <clears throat> and what this is, is this is just basically a front end to deploying and deploying applications and managing applications in Kubernetes. So we're going to click this Browse Catalog button here. And we're going we're to go up to this custom add, and we're going to say select from project. And this project is basically just a sort of, a sort of namespace. It's, it's where our application is. It's, it's authenticated as us, and it's isolated from other projects. <clears throat> but here. We've set up. We've set up some uh, templates that we can install automatically, and in this one, it's going to be a Jupyter notebook for the workshop. So we'll click on that. Is everyone everyone able to get here at this point? Is anybody not looking at this screen? All right. So we'll go to this Jupyter notebook. I'm going to click next. It's going to give us some options. It's going to explain what's, what's going on here. We have a few notebooks installed in this image. And it's going to give us a bunch of options. We don't actually need to change any of these because the defaults will be sensible. So we're just going to scroll through and click Create. All right, so it will say that this has been created successfully, hopefully. If it doesn't say this has been created successfully, if it gives you a different message, please raise your hand and we'll, we'll figure out what's going on there. And then I'm gonna <coughs> go to the project overview. So when I go to the project overview, I can see that I have a Kubernetes pod running with this notebook in it, and I have a route that I can click on to get to that notebook. So that's what I'm going to do. This, I mean, if you see this, you can just click on this notebook route. And then we're going to have to enter a password. And just like with the sheet of paper that had everyone's usernames on it, except worse, the password for everyone's notebook is developer, all lowercase. So now, um, how many people in here have used Jupyter notebooks before? So a lot of people. So we'll, we'll quickly go through what what uh, what to do if you haven't. But <clears throat> any questions so far? 
All right, so again, this is not really an introduction to machine learning, but just to sort of warm up and get used to the uh, get used to the Jupyter Notebook environment, we're going to start with a notebook that covers just a few basic machine learning techniques in the context of a Jupyter Notebook that uses Apache Spark. So, <coughs> so the, the important thing to know about Jupyter, if you've never used Jupyter before, it's a literate programming environment where you have code text, explanatory text, and results sort of all intermixed together. You can run a, an individual snippet of code and then rerun it as you see fit. <laughs> and the only thing you need to know about Jupyter is that if you press shift enter, you'll execute the cell you're on and go to the next cell, right? If you wanna know one other thing about Jupyter, it's that if you get really stuck, you can go up to this kernel menu and select restart and clear output. And that will sort of reset your, your environment here and, and get you started over. But what we can do here is shift enter and we go to the next cell since that was a text cell executing it didn't actually do anything. But here we have some code. And what we're doing is just setting up a connection to Spark. We're initializing Spark here. That'll take a second to run. While it's running, you'll have an asterisk next to the cell. And once it's completed, you'll have a numeral next to the cell. So what we're going to do is we're going to demonstrate some learning techniques with random data. And basically what this code does, um, you can dive in if you want, but it just generates a data frame like a database table of random data. And then we'll use that to sort of, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll set up plotting so that we can actually see what, what the things we're doing are going to do. And we'll plot our random data so we can, we can look at it. So this is not big data, right? This is data that we can fit in a plot without crashing your browser, but we're just sort of, we're just sort of demonstrating these techniques here. <clears throat> so we have, we have some data that looks like that. And the, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is just, just uh, k-means clustering, which is basically identifying groupings of things so that <clears throat> we minimize the, so that so that each thing is sort of, we, we minimize the variance from a thing to the center of the group of things that it's most similar to. And we're gonna use Spark's uh, machine learning pipelines, which is a library that's sort of designed to be easy to use. And we can see that setting this up is actually very few lines of code. We just sort of take this k-means implementation from Spark. We set up some parameters about how it works and then we we train a model on our random data. And we'll use that model to sort of annotate our random data with which group of things it's in and plot those. So we've plotted by color. So here if we have seven different clusters, we can see that our random data are actually in seven different clusters. Right? So we can use Jupyter, because this is interactive, we're not just sort of restricted to, to seeing what we've already had, we can actually, we can actually sort of play with this data. We'll, we'll say, I wanna see how many observations are in each cluster. And this is a good way to sort of build intuitions about these kinds of things. Here we see that we don't have the same number of things in each cluster, but that for each thing that's in a given cluster, we've minimized the variance to the, the center of that cluster. And we can try changing it actually because, because this is interactive and we can, we can change the notebook. So let's say in this, in this cell here, I can say I wanna see what it looks like with, with 13 clusters, for example. I can change it to a different number and run that. <clears throat> so and with 13 clusters, it looks different than it does with, with seven because there are more clusters. Right? So, um, so that's that. Uh, we, have, we have a couple of sidebars in the notebook. If you're interested in sort of diving a little deeper on this stuff, we, we, we talk, about, talk about sort of uh, how we train, how we set up model training and, and how we think about the distances between different things. A really important uh, feature of a lot of machine learning algorithms is, is deciding whether two things are similar or dissimilar. So we, we talk about a few metrics for those. Um, any questions at this point? So. 
All right. So the next thing we'll talk about is, is binary classification, where you have basically examples of uh, a Boolean function, and you want to learn, you want to learn that function from examples. So you have yes and no data, and you want to say, you want to learn the boundary between the yes and the no cases, basically. And what we're going to do is we're going to take our random data and we're going to generate some random labels. And we'll generate those labels so that it's not a totally clean separation between the two classes of things, between green and blue. You can think of them as, as uh, yes and no. But, but there is, there is a, a separation, right? The, the data, these data are clearly, there's clearly a separation. It's just not necessarily a clean one, right? So we'll try and learn a model there. <clears throat> And we'll, the technique we'll use is called logistic regression here. We're just going to sort of run through that. And it, like with the k-means, it's very simple to, simple to set this up. We're going to split our data into training and test sets so that we can evaluate the performance of our model on data it hasn't seen already. And that very fast. Uh, if we look at how how this uh, how annotating the data frame with our predictions, we can see that we have the all of the input data we had. We have our label, and then we also have a prediction along with a probability. So it's not like the k-means clustering where you said what's the nearest cluster center and there's just an answer. We have both a prediction and a probability, and we can plot what our predictions were. And if you scroll back up, you can see that <clears throat> this is actually identifying a clean linear split between the two classes, right? Um, it's not identifying, it's not memorizing where things are, it's identifying a linear boundary between them. And it's actually sort of fun to sort of experiment with plotting. In this case, we could, this is I mean, maybe not something you do in production, but we can plot just the samples that we mispredicted as well. Um, by doing a query and sort of plotting the results of that query. <laughs> now, we want to sort of figure out whether or not this classifier is doing a good job, right? So we need, we need a way to say, is this classifier doing a good job? And, and the thing I like to think about is this is like, is it, is it good enough to be right 95% of the time? For example, like what's good enough? Does it sound like it's good enough to be right 95% of the time? In life, I'm usually happy if I'm right, if I'm wrong one out of 20 times, right? Um, exactly, exactly. So if you're trying to detect fraud and 1% of transactions are fraud and you just say, nope, not fraud, <laughs> every single time, you're right 99% of the time. But you're not very useful, <laughs> right? So we want to actually sort of talk about whether a classifier is, is doing a good job, um, sort of not by how often it's right, but, but by what kinds of predictions it's making in different cases. And we'll use, a, uh, we'll use something called a confusion matrix to look at this. And basically we have the true positives, so if we, if we are the true predictions along one diagonal and the false predictions along another. And in this case we see that we had uh, 935 true negatives and 961 true positives. We had 78 cases where we predicted true, but it was actually false. And we had 74 cases where we predicted false, but it was actually true. And depending on your application, you're going to care more about one of these kinds of errors or the other. Right? Like if you're, uh, I mean, Famously, there are lots of real-life processes where people are biased towards avoiding false positives or avoiding false negatives, right? Like, do you want to identify all the cases that are actually true, or do you want to restrict how many cases are false that you misidentify as true? We can, think of, can you think of examples in this case? Anyone? Of each case? So with, with payments, for example, say, say you're payment processing again. Like say you have a customer who's trying to pay for a taxi and you know that the transaction is occurring far from your customer's home. 
you, you're suspicious about this transaction, is it better to flag it as fraudulent or not in that case? Right, right. So it, it, the answer is it, it depends because you, you don't want to really inconvenience your customer in this case. If they're, if they're legitimately there, um, they'll want to pay for that taxi before they can talk to you on the phone <laughs> and explain that it's really them. Now, on the other hand, if you have a transaction involving virtual goods that's not time sensitive, so you have a customer buying virtual currency in a video game, right? And you've never had it, the customer has never done this before and it's happening at some hour that's not usual for them and you know, happening from a location that's far away from the recent transactions your customers had. In that case, you can flag that transaction and it doesn't really inconvenience anyone and the merchant is also not gonna be able to recover from whoever is using that card fraudulently in that case. I mean, there are other examples too. I mean, if you think about like predicting, predicting disease, is it, is it okay to have a false positive predicting a disease? Well, it depends on how bad the treatment is, right? If the treatment is expensive or onerous, you don't want to have false positives in that case. If the disease is particularly bad, you don't want to have false negatives. So there are a lot of ways to turn a matrix like this into a single number, depending on whether you care about false positives or false, false negatives, avoiding false positives or avoiding false negatives, and the family of techniques to do that is called the F-score. We can also look at, um, you know, we got a, we got a, we got a probability from our logistic regression, right? We don't write programs typically that deal with probabilities, we write programs that deal with Booleans, right? You, you, you can, there are programming languages where you can program with probabilities, but typically, show of hands, Booleans in programs? <laughs> probabilities instead of Booleans in programs? <laughs> Neither? So uh, we want some way to turn the probability into a Boolean, right? So we have to decide a cutoff, right? Is an 85% confidence good enough to say true? Is a 45% confidence good enough to say true? And basically what we can do is we can plot how the false positive rate is related to the true positive rate as we change that threshold. And just make this a little smaller so we can fit the whole graph on the but we can see that with this, because these data were very easy to separate, um, we, can, we, can set our, we can set our threshold so that we can get a very low false positive rate in exchange for a very high true positive rate. If you have a curve like this that looks like a diagonal line, that means you may as well be flipping a coin. It's from one corner to the other, it's, that's a coin toss. But the closer this is to the upper left corner, the better, better your model is doing. And this, this gets you into another way that you can turn the performance of one of these models into a, into a single number. So because, because of the uh, projector trouble, we have, we have an example of, of linear regression as well with a classic data set. I think um, I'm inclined to sort of skip that at this point, but w these notebooks are all online and it's, it's easy to go through them if, if you're interested in, in sort of learning more about uh, these other, 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 other technique. Um, so what I'm gonna do now, though, is, is ask for questions. Any questions? And then I'm gonna shut down the, uh, the kernel here. You don't have to do this if you wanna continue experimenting with this uh, later in the session, but I'm just gonna shut this down because we're, we are running on shared infrastructure here and just keep everything running fast. And then I'm gonna go back to my home tab where I have all of these other notebooks and I'm gonna go to this uh, PySpark notebook which is sort of an introduction to how Spark, Spark's execution model and how to use Spark for data engineering and we'll get into training an interesting model for natural language processing in this notebook. Okay, so as before, we're going to uh, import the PySpark module and set up a Spark session. And the fundamental abstraction in Spark that we sort of, we sort of hinted at earlier is this um, lazy immutable parallel collection, right? Where you have a collection and each partition is of the collection is gonna be on a different, potentially on a different node 
in your cluster, a different computer. And we always have a way to reconstruct these from, from some recipe. Every operation we do produces another recipe. We have a way to reconstruct them. And we're going to make one of these in the easiest possible way, which is backed by an array in memory. So I'm going to say I want to take an array in memory, and I want to distribute that across multiple nodes in my system. There are links to documentation sort of throughout this notebook. There are a lot of other ways you can build one of these structures. But we can do all these operations on these things once we have one. Now, these are all lazy operations. So when I do these things, uh, for example, keeping only the even numbers, doubling every element, keeping only multiples of five, taking the intersections of the even numbers with the multiples of five to get the multiples of 10, um, actually running these doesn't do anything yet. It just sort of constructs a recipe for how to create a new collection. And it's this, it's this combination of laziness and immutability that gets you the resiliency for free. So you can always replay when something goes away. Um, when we actually want to get a value out of one of these things, a computation gets scheduled on our infrastructure and runs. So in this case, we want to look at the number of even numbers we had and the number of double, the number of uh, things in this doubled collection, which is just everything multiplied by two. And we had 9,999 things in the original collection because it's not an inclusive range. And we had 4,989 even numbers in that. If we want to take the multiples of 10, we'll learn something about Spark's execution model in the process, which is that when we take the intersection of these two things, it's actually not in order. Right? It's just we're taking five of these things, and because we've, we've shuffled things around to get the intersection of these two collections, um, they're not in any order unless we actually explicitly impose an ordering on them like we did up here for this sorted tens. And there are a lot of other actions that you can do on these things. You can, you can say, I want to sample a large data set, which is useful for sort of sanity checking or, or inspecting things. I want to turn a data set into a single value with an associative and commutative binary operation, like maximum, um, and so on. So there are a lot of different things we can do with those. Now, this is, this is actually, if you've done a lot of parallel programming in the past, this is actually a pretty decent compute model, right? Like compared to programming for MPI or you know, threads or you know, any number of, of other sort of things you could have done. But it's still pretty low level. And people, I think a lot of people prefer to work at a level that's more like a database, database query. So just, uh, just for context, we'll, we'll look at what this looks like in, in Spark. And we're going to load a Parquet file consisting of data from the Fed message system. So does anyone use, any, any people use Linux on a daily basis, Linux users? So if you're a Linux user, do you, do you use Fedora, or do you know about the, any Fedora users? Any Fedora users who don't work for Red Hat? <laughs> um, so, so the Fedora project, and Debian actually uses the Fedora, Fed message as well, but they have, it's, it's almost like a Kappa architecture, where everything that happens in Fedora, instead of having a bunch of services that are tightly coupled through APIs, they have services that are loosely coupled because they all publish and consume results from a centralized bus. And the cool thing about Fedora and other projects that use this is it's not just open source, it's open infrastructure. So you can, you can actually tap into this. You can actually publish to this bus yourself. Any, anyone can, right? Nothing critical depends on a message that isn't signed. But you could, you could publish to this bus and you could download these messages yourself. So anything that happens in the Fedora project, um, which is a you know, Linux distribution, so it's an open source community that has over 10,000 contributors and you know a lot of a lot of infrastructure to sort of build a Linux distribution. Anything that happens in the Fedora project gets published to this Fed message bus. And so we have um, basically a batch um, export of some of these messages here in this parquet file. And we can see that we have a bunch of a bunch of fields with different types. It's it's a lot like a database table. 
So we can actually treat it like a database table using this. Uh, we can either use a SQL query, or in this case, I'm using a query DSL, where I'm going to say I'm going to look at, I'm going to get a count of every message uh, grouped by category and sort of take the top 20 of these. Right? So we see that, that most of the messages on this are related to building packages and rebuilding packages. If, if you've used Linux distribution, you know that you have updates a lot because the packages are all maintained by volunteers. And um, then some of these other things are for, for other kinds of, of package builds or for uh, QA checks. Um, Fedora actually has sort of a fun badges system, which is like a gamified achievement system for contributing to the Fedora project. So that, that does a lot of this stuff as well. And we can see that as we scroll down, we get from a lot of messages coming from automated builds to fewer messages happening from, from other sources. Uh, we can also just sort of see how many things are in here. Again, this is not big data. This is data that we could fit in a container image that we can distribute to people easily. Um, and then we can, we can use uh, the sort of show method of just the data frame itself without running a query to actually look at the data. And this is a nice thing to do if we're sanity checking a new source that we haven't dealt with before. And when we look at this data source, we'll actually see that we have this message field doesn't look very useful. It looks like a JSON serialized string. And running into data that's not exactly in the format you want it in never happens in the real world. But because we want to introduce you to an imaginary hypothetical scenario, we'll, we'll cover it in this, uh, in this workshop of how we would sort of work around that. So how many people in here have written a user-defined function for a traditional relational database before? Anyone? Was it, was it fun? Would you do it again? <laughs> OK. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to sort of step through and, and look at what, how to write a user-defined function to turn these JSON encoded objects into structured data. And it's actually pretty simple. So for the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to extract that in a resilient distributed data set. We could actually ask Spark to infer a schema for this, but because of the way that these JSON is used by the Fed Message project, we won't get a useful schema. Um, if you're interested, you can click through here and, and see a lot of uh, more detail about that. But what we're going to do is we're going to write a really simple function that basically just says, we know that some fields are interesting, and we know that some fields are more than likely to be in one of these objects. And the fields that we care about um, are here, and if we have all of these fields in something, we'll turn that into a structured object that we can actually do queries against, sort of directly. And so we're, we're first defining the fields we care about. Then we're describing the return type of the function. So here we're going to say we have a structure of strings, because uh, all of these fields we care about are actually strings. Then we're going to write the actual implementation of the function. And, and how many people here are comfortable with Python? How many people here are totally uncomfortable with Python, or mostly uncomfortable with Python? OK, so all we're doing in this function is we're going to try and deserialize that string as a JSON object, and we're going to return a list of these fields in order if they exist. If we have an exception, we're just going to return an empty structure, because we're just doing sort of a quick and dirty example here. Now, if you've those of you who've done user-defined functions for sort of traditional relational databases know that you, now you have a, you're, you're generating a make file and you're linking with a library and you're debugging and it's not working. Um, but here, we're just actually going to sort of use this function in, in Spark to say, yeah, define this, this Python function as a user-defined function with this type. And then we can use it in a query and actually add it to our data frame. And now, instead of having that string in our message field, we have a structure that has all of these fields and we can do something useful with them. So we could do a lot of useful things with this fed message data, but we want to do some, we want to do some intelligent applications. Um, so we want to do something intelligent with it. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at comments and we're going to say, I bet that the, pe the way people talk in comments on software package updates and bug reports and 
comments on, on other sort of open source project infrastructure could teach us something about the way that people use language. So we're going to write a function to extract comments, and we're going to turn that into a resilient distributed data set. We're going to, and then we're going to split that into a sequence of words, basically. All right. Now what we're going to do is we're going to train a word to vec model. We don't have time to explain what's actually going on in word to vec today, but word to vec is a really cool technique for lang natural language processing where you look at a sort of corpus of natural language text and you convert every word that you see into a vector representation that has these sort of semantic encodings. So if two words, if the vectors for two words have a similar angle, that means that they're likely to be synonymous, which means that they were likely to appear in the same sorts of places in the original document. Um, and you can, also, you can also sort of do linear transformations on these vectors and say, and get analogies from them. So it's a very cool technique. We're just gonna use it for finding synonyms and we'll sort of fire through and actually train that model. This will take a, a little bit uh, longer than some of the other things we've done. But once we've done that, we can look at the words that we've... So what we're doing is we're just using, the again, the Spark machine learning library to train one of these models and then find the synonyms for a given word. And the word we're going to find synonyms for is works. So while this is computing for all of us, think about what you might think is a synonym for works if by synonym we mean word that can appear in roughly the same position in a sentence as works, and if our only exposure to language is the comments people write on bug reports. And we can see that we have a bunch of other words that sort of look like works. And we, and we have looks, um, maybe looks good. We have run and as, which are not super useful. But we can take this, uh, we can take this code here and we can experiment, right? We can uh, we can try a different try a different uh, had a different query, and say maybe we'll get the top ten synonyms for works. And once we have the model, the query is very fast. But you see that people are again using different forms of the verb to work. People are thanking people because something works now. Um, you know, these words are all sort of going to appear in, in, uh, in bug reports in about the same place. Right? If we want to sort of run other, other kinds of queries by editing the cell again and looking for a different word, we can see some of the words that we have in the model. And some of these are people's, uh, some of these are people's uh, Fedora usernames. Uh, a lot of them have punctuation in them because we didn't do anything to clean this up. We're just sort of demonstrating how to do this as quickly as possible. So you just trained a natural language model on messy structured data that you impose structure on yourself in a notebook running in a container. That's sort of cool. Any questions? So if you want to take this further, we do have some sort of exercises that you can, you can look at to, to try and take this, uh, take this further. Um, but right now I want to get on to the technique that we're actually going to turn into an application. So I'm going to shut this down. And I'm going to go back to home. And we're going to go to the last notebook, which is this Vare notebook. And what we're going to show you how to do is we're going to show you how to be responsible for the global financial crisis of 2008. Not, not really, but this is, this is a technique to sort of evaluate how risky a portfolio of investments is. And the idea is we're going to characterize what we expect the returns of a portfolio of stocks to be. And we're going to say in the worst 5% of case simulations, we're going to run a bunch of random simulations. We're going to do a Monte Carlo simulation. And in the worst 5% of simulations, how much money do we lose? And this is sort of a, this is sort of a uh, common metric for sort of evaluating portfolios. Um, I will emphasize that 
We'll start with a very dumb technique to demonstrate it. We'll, we'll show you how you can make it smarter. But in any case, please do not use this code or anything that looks like it to move around actual money. Um, okay. Can, can you use this code to move around actual money? You could, but please don't. <laughs> so, okay. So we're going to start as before by, uh, by setting up a Spark session, connection to Spark. We have some uh, end of day data uh, from, from stock closing prices. So we're going to look at that end of day data, again, in a parquet file, so it's, it's easy to load. And then what we're going to do is we're going we're to look at all of the end of day data that we have for each security, and we're going to say for each pair of, pair of consecutive days, what was the rate of change? So we're going to look at the sort of sequence of closing prices for each security and say, how much did it change between each two days? And add that as another column to our data frame. We're going to use uh, SQL windowing functions to do this. And that'll take a minute, but we'll just sort of show the first examples to sort of sanity check that we're doing the right thing. OK, so we have some, some rates of change. Um, for those of you who know anything, know something about the stock market in the U.S., um, up until uh, 2000, 2001, uh, stocks in the U.S. were not traded in cents. They were traded in eighths of a dollar, which is why some of these older results all look like they might be an eighth. We, we truncated to two decimal points, so you can't see that it's 0.125, but it sort of looks like an eighth. So now that we have all of the actual observed um, returns for each of these stocks, we can use this to sort of fit a distribution. And because we're not actually going to use this code to do actual investing, we can use a very simple distribution. We'll use the normal distribution. I, I sort of have the intuition that stock returns aren't really normally distributed, but we're just going to, we're going to do this because it's simple, right? So we're going to get the, uh, the mean and variance of the, the rates of change for each of these symbols. And then we have parameters that we can use in a simulation, right? Because we can, we can say, like, for this symbol ACFN, we're going to have um, a normal distribution with this mean and this variance, and that's how much it's going to change from day to day. And then we can run a simulation, right? Everything making sense so far? Have I assumed any knowledge of stocks in the United States that is there anything I could claim about that that would make it may, Probably not, right? It's, it's investing. Right? So, so we're then going to collect these parameters in memory so that we can use them to run a simulation. And we're going to use, uh, so we've used Spark for the data processing here. We've used Spark to sort of do the aggregates to train, to train our, dist fit our distributions. And then we're also going to use Spark to orchestrate the actual simulation. And just to sanity check this uh, map that we have here, once we get a result, we'll uh, look, at the, look at the value for Red Hat. This may take a minute, depending on how the shared infrastructure is looking. OK, so, so that's, a, that's the result there. And to, to run this simulation, we're going to set, set up a random portfolio of stocks. We're going to identify what the most recent price for every stock in our random portfolio is. And we're going to say that we have a certain number of shares of each random stock. And then we're just going to run a few days of simulations and say, how, how much does each of these change? And how does that reflect the total value of our portfolio? Does that make sense? So we'll get the most recent prices for each security. And then when I'm thinking about simulations, I really like to think, how do you go from one step to the next? And then basically, it's very easy to say, I'm going to compose repeating that into, into an entire simulation. So we'll start with our random portfolio. Um, and then we'll run the simulation by sort of having a function that goes from one day to the next day and running it a certain number of days. So that's. Uh, Keep running, and we'll just get started on the, the rest of this while it's going there. 
All we have here are functions to generate a random portfolio. We've seeded our random number generator so everyone can get the same results. And, or at least uh, similar results and then we're gonna We're going to sort of generate a sequence of random seeds there. And then we're going to define how the simulation works in terms of running a single day of simulated market activity, where we basically update each update each stock. Uh, are holding each stock by how much it would have changed. And then we run the simulation by sort of combining the results from each day over however long we want to run it for. So we're going to take all of our random seeds. So we have, if we're going to run 10,000 simulation trials, we're going to, we're going to take 10,000 random seeds. And we're going to use Spark to orchestrate these simulations. And this is actually very quick because Spark is lazy and it's not doing anything until it's required to. But it's also very quick because it's a pretty easy, easy operation. So we'll get these results. And let's actually just sort of plot, plot a, uh, plot what our value at risk is looking like. So we can look at a histogram of how much money we gained or lost. And especially if you're dealing with, with values that have this many zeros, do not use this code to make actual investment decisions. But uh, we see that typically the market trends up, so it looks like, uh, it looks like up is, is likely, but a lot of these things are sort of, sort of clustered around zero. And we can actually plot, um, plot the distribution of results. And we can see that um, we can see that in the the five percent value at risk, we the five worst five percent of simulations we lost at least like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars or so. Um, in the best simulations, we we did much better, but we're we're not concerned about the best simulations. We're concerned about sort of putting a number on our risk in this application. So yeah, two hundred and thirty thousand dollars is what we lost in the worst at least two hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the worst five percent. Um, I think one cool thing about having simulations like this is that you can you can run the simulations again and collect different data if you decide that you want to explore how things happened. In this case, we'll say, um, what does it mean to have a really bad portfolio, right? What, what what does a bad simulation look like? Is it is it bad every day? Is it just a couple of bad days that really really sink you? And we can do that by actually plotting the walks that you know certain representative simulations did. And running the same one, we can see that you know many of our our simulations at the 20th to 80th percentile are are all very similar, but our worst and our best are actually uh, actually it's just a couple of bad days or a couple of very good days that that really impact this particular portfolio uh, quite quite a lot. So we said we don't think that. Stock returns are normally distributed, but we can actually experiment with finding a better distribution. What we don't have time to go into this right now, but I'm just going to show you that we can sort of sort of use these interactive tools to identify that yes, the normal distribution is not actually a good fit. This is the actual observed distributions of returns for uh, for RHT, uh, which is Red Hat, and. As it doesn't look very much like a bell curve to me. You can actually sort of look at how bad it is by plotting a normal distribution over it and see that it's not, not very close at all. So in the rest of this notebook, we actually have, um, we actually have some uh, sort of a way to experiment with finding different distributions if you want to have a better, um, a better fit. But I would like to turn it over to Mike at this point and talk about how to actually turn this into an application. All right. Thanks, Will. Um, all right. So we've just kind of like seen how we prototype a technique using the notebook. And now the question is, 
What do we do with that technique? How do we actually bring it into an application that we might expose to users? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that process, and then we'll walk through deploying an application. So I'm going to go back here for a second, and I'm just going to go through a couple slides. So this is the application architecture that we're going to kind of put together here, right? There's going to be a kind of a React component that the user is going to see a web page where they'll be able to put in their own portfolio. You know, we just saw how we created a random portfolio, and then we, we picked a number of days we wanted to simulate and a number of simulations. So we want to give that ability to our users now. We want to let them put a portfolio in, and then they'll be able to tell how many simulations they'd want to run, and then hopefully get back the kind of results that we just saw there. So that React front end will talk to a Flask server on the back end, which is a Python web server, and it's going to have PySpark in there, and in the case of this kind of prototype application, we've also got the data embedded in with it. And you can see that's the Parquet data there. And we'll need a Spark cluster to talk to to kind of do the work for us. So what we're going to walk through is kind of how we deploy that Spark cluster and then how we deploy the application. And so first, this looks like this is the code that came exactly from one of the cells that we just went through, right? This how to simulate a daily return step. And what it turns out was that this could actually be pulled directly into the application. This is the application code. We took that right from the cell and just put it into our application, you know, added some comments that were taken from the comments that Will had generated in the notebook. So as a developer, this was a really powerful tool for me because I could take the notebook and he had put his thoughts in there and I was able to read up about the techniques he was using and then see how that would apply to our code. Likewise, you might remember this cell was in there as well to see how we simulate one step of what's happening. Well, in the same manner, I was able to bring that directly into the application. I added some comments based on what Will had said in the notebook and we're conveying the information from the notebook into our application now. So that's just, that's kind of an example of how we could take the information directly from the notebook and bring it into our application. So let's see what that looks like inside of our projects now. So I'm going to go back to the screen, and I invite you all to follow along. And what I'll do first is kind of close down the notebook. So the first thing we want to do is deploy Apache Spark inside of our project. And so I'll go up to the Add to Project and back to Select from Projects. Are, can everybody see this screen? Is anybody having trouble getting here? OK. So I'll click Select from Project. And what I want to deploy is this, whoop, is this Oshinko web UI service. That's going to be the tool we'll use to manage our Spark cluster. So I'll click on that, click Next, and click Next again. Now, this again is where we could customize the deployment of this application. If we wanted to change the way it was behaving or the information it has, you know, we could change the images that it deploys, those type of things. But we don't need to change that for this. So I'll click Create. And I'll close that. Now what you should see is that this Oshinko web uh, pod is starting to deploy. Now ideally, we're just kind of waiting for it to get ready. Uh, Kubernetes has the idea of kind of health checks and readiness checks inside the containers. So in this case, since we have a web application deploying, Kubernetes can actually look, and OpenShift can look through Kubernetes to see, is that application ready to run yet? So yours may be ready. Mine's not ready yet. Uh, all right, there we go. So now you can see it's, it's running. What I'll do is I'll click on this link here. Let me just make this a little bigger. So this is uh, the Oshinko Cluster Manager, and this is part of the RAD Analytics project, and you can find this tool on that RAD Analytics website. Uh, it's pretty simple. It just allows us to do kind of basic deploy, scale, destroy, um, you know, for your Spark cluster. So I'll give this cluster a name. Just call it Cluster 1. I only really need to have one worker for what we're doing today, but I could specify more if I wanted it to be larger, and I could scale it as I'm running. Additionally, there are advanced options we could have here. If we needed to customize how Spark was being deployed or if we wanted to use a special image to deploy this cluster, we could do that through the advanced configuration. You don't need to click on this, but I'll, I'll just show you what it looks like. Um, you know, there's different options for how we can configure the masters and the workers. We can tell it to use a different Spark image if we like. You know, 
this kind of gives us the ability to change how our Spark cluster is deployed. So I'll just click Deploy. And you can see here it's starting to kind of already detect what's going on. And if, and if I click back to my uh, project view, you can see that it's already deploying these two, uh, a Spark master and a Spark worker. And if you want, you can see how this works. You can, you can tell this is Spark. You can go into the, into the application here and then click on the UI route. And you can say, I'm actually looking at, you know, this is the Spark master that's living inside my project now. So, okay, my Spark cluster is running. Now what I want to do is deploy the application and attach it to that cluster. And I keep doing that. I should take that out of full screen mode. Okay. Um, so the first thing I want to kind of note here is the URL for the master. Uh, how many people here are familiar with Spark or have used Spark before? Okay, so a fair number of people. Like Spark uses a URI like this so that we can inform uh, our driver application how it will attach to that cluster. So I just want to make note of that because I'm going to use it in, when I deploy my application. So from the project view, I'll click Add to Project, and I'll go into Select from Project again. And this time what I want to do is select this value at risk web application. And this is the application we just showed the architecture for. So I'll select that and click next. You know, this is the, the description of it. Now, before we hadn't really done anything on these screens, but this time we will. And what we'd like to do is change the Spark master so that we can give it that URI to our Spark cluster. So when the application deploys, it will know how to attach to that cluster. So I'll type Spark. Uh, I called mine cluster one. You may have called yours something else. And that's really all I need to add for this moment because this, right now this application only really needs that one piece of information. So with that in place, I'll click create. So this application is, is this VAR sandbox, what you'll see in here. And this is kind of the, the prototype application that we might build if we were you know, the web developer who was working with a data scientist who developed a technique like this. And in this case, we're simply deploying it from an image that we've already pushed up to our image registry. But we could use a source to image model to actually have OpenShift build this for us and then deploy Spark automatically. But in this case, we wanted to walk through the steps kind of individually to show you how it works. So when this is ready, you want to click on the link that's associated with it. OK. So now what we're looking at is, you know, this obviously doesn't look like the notebook at all, but you can see how we're exposing the information that was important in the notebook to our users, right? We can allow them to add stocks into the portfolio. So let's, instead of using a random portfolio, we're going to use a portfolio that's determined, right? So I'll say, I'm going to give myself 100 shares of Red Hat. Then I click Add, and you can see, okay, we're, we're building up a, a query that's going to run against the, the algorithms that we just put together. And maybe, you know, I'll give myself uh, 100 shares of Google as well. Now, the second part of this was the other part of what we were running in the notebook, which is, you know, how many days would I like to run this simulation for and how many simulations would I like to run? So I'll pick values that are similar to what we had in the notebook. I'd say run it for five days and do 10,000 simulations. And when I hit submit, what you'll see is that, you know, we've got kind of some information coming back telling us what was happening. And then I've also got a graph that looks very similar to what we just saw in the notebook. And so as an application developer, the power of the notebook was that I was able to see what Will wanted to visualize and what he thought was important. And I immediately turned that into something that we would expose to the users, right? Because perhaps this is what they'd like to see too. They'd like to visualize how much value is at risk and they'd like to see what the 5% value is. So I think for me, the notebook really became an important source of information because I could take what Will had learned and what he had taught me through the notebook and bring it directly into the application. Is anybody having trouble getting to this point? Did anybody just kind of blow up on them? Or hopefully it worked out. OK. So this is just a simple example. And what I'll do now is kind of talk about where we might take this next.
So that's an alpha version of this. We baked the data into the image, which we would probably never want to do in a production situation because our data might be changing. So what would the next steps be on this application? Well, the next thing we might do is change the structure of what it looks like internally. What we saw here was a very simple, you know, there was one microservice running the application, and it was attaching to a Spark cluster, and that was it. But what we might want to do is bring the data out of the container with the application and put it into some sort of storage, a database or an object store or somewhere that the application could get to. And likewise, we might want to separate the front end logic into another service of its own. So you can see on, on kind of the left hand side here, I've now just got a single Flask service running the React front end. And behind that, I've now created a REST interface that does the Pi Spark work for me. So I don't have to have the Spark application running the web front end as well. All it does is take requests you know, to run these calculations. And then our Spark cluster would kind of stay the same. So this is how we kind of use the microservice architecture to start to decompose our application into several pieces. And, and what this kind of gives us the ability to do then is we could have a front-end team just working on this Flask app that shows the React application, and we could have a separate team working on the Spark application. And if they had agreed on a REST interface ahead of time, then the two teams could work in parallel, and you, know, you could use a mock server to provide information back to the front-end, and you could see how both teams could be working at the same time on a larger application, and they could vary their features based on what they needed to do. Another piece to bringing this to a production level would be to add more of the source to image uh, workflow into this. So what we just saw was how we can use the Oshinko web UI to manually create a Spark cluster. But you can imagine that if this was a production application, we wouldn't want someone to always be managing that Spark cluster. You know, we would want that to kind of occur as part of the infrastructure. So we have a, another tool that we call Oshinko Source to Image. And what it can do is it can take code directly from a Git repository. And in this case, I've kind of added a Jenkins step in here, because you could imagine you would want to have some sort of testing before you did anything to production. And then that source code would become an application container inside OpenShift. And when it launched the application, it would also create a Spark cluster for it automatically. And so now this could become you know, kind of a CI CD loop that we could do in production without having to have someone in the middle managing the individual pieces. And the way that OpenShift is structured and the way that kind of Kubernetes is structured on the underside um, makes it very easy to repeat this pattern and to share it between people. H how many folks in here are, are familiar with Kubernetes? Okay, so some people. So Kubernetes uses um, JSON or YAML-based manifest to kind of command it and tell it what you want it to do. You, you tell it a state that you would like it to be in. You say, I'd like, it, I'd like to have this many pods of this. Those manifests can be shared between developers. So as I create this application, if I want to share it back with Will, all I need to do is give him my manifests, and then he can run the same thing on his version of OpenShift or his infrastructure, and he'll have the same pipeline that I would have. And so it makes it very easy for us to share these things back and forth between developers. So we have about 10 minutes left for questions. Uh, you know, first I want to thank you all for joining us and you know, spending kind of a warm afternoon. RedAnalytics.io uh, is our project website where you can find all the community links and we have tutorials and videos up there. And then this, this workshop link here, you'll find all the notebooks that we use today are there and there's documentation as well. And then this uh, Ver Sandbox is the application that we just deployed. So you can go kind of check it out in the templates there. And if you want to get in touch with Will or myself, uh, these are our emails and our Twitter handles. You know, reach out and say hi. And I guess with that, any questions? Thanks, great workshop. Um, 
Is any of this open source, and, or how much of it is open source? And then the second part is Kubeflow is getting a lot of traction, and, and this is quite similar to Kubeflow in many ways. Can you compare and contrast yeah, Run so, Analytics and Kubeflow? Yeah, so the, to the first question, yes, it's all open source. Uh, everything that you saw here today from OpenShift on up is completely open source. Everything that we were running was all open source infrastructure and it was actually run on Google Cloud. So this was using everything just from the open source. Same with all the applications and the notebooks you saw. Those, those are all open source. As far as Kubeflow, um, I'll let Will like, you know, kind of take that one. Yeah, yeah, Kubeflow is super exciting. So Kubeflow is a project to basically make it possible to do machine learning on Kubernetes. It was announced um, six months ago at KubeCon in Austin, or I guess more than six months ago now. Um, this, uh, it's, it, it does, as, as you point out, have some overlap with RadAnalytics.io. So there's some sort of historical details that may or may not be interested to people who aren't interested in Kubeflow inside baseball, or Kubernetes inside baseball. But um, basically, we're, we're really excited about that project as well. You know, we've been, we've been doing the RadAnalytics.io project for quite some time, and we're really excited to see everyone else excited about machine learning and Kubernetes. We're actively involved in Kubeflow as well. Um, I think some of the main differences are that we we sort of built RadAnalytics.io before some of the features that Kubeflow is depending on were available in Kubernetes. Um, and so so we're not using those features yet. Uh, we, we will be, uh, and we'll be sort of working with Kubeflow to, we, we, we want to get our, our Spark cluster management stuff into Kubeflow, for example. So it's, it's really, a, you know, we think it's a good thing and we're glad to see it. I gotta throw one more. Sorry, security. What's the, the the is it Istio or is there any sort of integrated security or what's the? Yeah, so that's that's another good another good point is that um, like Istio, you get you get some Istio integration for free with with recent versions of OpenShift, um, but security is another big difference between OpenShift and upstream Kubernetes. Um, OpenShift is sort of targeted more for an enterprise audience that's more concerned about security. So the 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 policies are different. You're assuming that you run. It is. We assume you're running under SE Linux. You're running with arbitrary user IDs instead of Azure. Um, so that that is another distinction, I guess. And I guess just to add to that, what what you saw here today with the Oshinko tooling. So if you were manipulating the clusters from inside OpenShift, that that's all gated by OpenShift's login. So there there is a strong um, you know authentication that happens there. We actually used an unauthenticated Oshinko web UI today just for simplicity, but we have a version of it as well that will use the same login backend that OpenShift does. So you can ensure that no one who's not authorized is creating resources on your cluster. So that's kind of from an outside perspective. There are ways to close it off uh, so and that it's not just available. I think the other thing is that everyone had their own Spark cluster running in their own OpenShift project today. None of those was accessible from outside of your project. Yeah. Right, so if you weren't in that project, you couldn't. So we don't actually do anything specific with Istio to say like you can only access this cluster from this application. But. Yeah, it uses the standard Kubernetes namespaces and whatnot. So, are there more questions? Yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you from my side as well. Um, I somehow missed the point where we went from the notebook to actually to the Oshinko, um distribution tooling. Um, so we had this var notebook cluster thing um, and we're fiddling around there. And if I would now go back and change parameters there or I don't know, even the underlying framework, everything, would that automatically be available in the other one? So are they connected or is it all replicated again in the model that is deployed in the Oshinko thing? Or how's well, the connection there? No, like what, what what we're demonstrating here is very much like a manual development process, right? Um, there was nothing automated about what happened in the notebook and then went to the application. So this is, imagine if we were both on a development team together and Will is the data scientist and I'm kind of the application engineer. What we're demonstrating is how you know, Will could work in the notebook and create that kind of rich conversation and algorithm there and then he could give the notebook to me I would learn from it and create an application out of it. So there was no automated, you know, kind of code generation happening there. It was a manual creation. So, yeah, I mean, two, two responses to that. I mean, I think beyond what Mike said is that, is that um, 
One is that having these things running in containers, you actually do have a reproducible environment. Like notebooks are, notebooks are a great tool for reproducible research, but a lot of people aren't disciplined enough to make them actually reproducible. And with containers, if you're not disciplined, if you don't sort of take those steps to make sure that the packages you depend on and the data you depend on are available in the container, it just won't run at all for you or for anyone. So if you've been in a situation where you've gotten a notebook from a colleague that didn't work on your computer and you had to figure out why, that, that sort of gets rid of that problem. I think the other thing is like, in terms of having something more automatic where you say, I have this notebook cell and I'd like to publish it as a service that an application could use, it sounds like a good project. Someone should work on it. Yeah, okay, thank you. Still have time for questions, if anyone? Cool. Okay. Oh, we have to. It's the obvious one. Yeah, Kubernetes has support for GPUs. Uh, what's the status of GPUs on, on right on Linux? Yeah. Um, so it's it's really just a, we have we have TensorFlow training, and it's I think it's really just a configuration issue to to set it up so that you have the right labels on your nodes to run a job with GPUs. Yeah. It, the same support for GPU that's in Kubernetes is an open shift. Yeah. yeah. Like Will's saying, it's it's just a matter of kind of labeling out the nodes that have GPUs on them, and then making sure that your applications get to those nodes. So there's an extra layer of configuration that would take place. You would write your own manifest. How do you find out which nodes have GPUs and things like that? Or so there's just, it's just labels, right? Yeah. Label, yeah. So if you look in the Kubernetes docs, there's yeah. a thing called selectors and labels and annotations. Those, the selectors and the labels, you would have your physical hardware nodes. They, when you deploy the kubelets on those nodes, they would have a special selector on them that would say like GPU enabled. And then when you write your application and you're writing the manifest for your application, you could say, I only want this container to run on a node that has the label or the selector GPU enabled, right? So you would configure your application, and then Kubernetes would handle the scheduling for you, basically. And you, you have to do all the CUDA setup yourself, I guess, in, in Docker or? Uh, presumably, yeah. you're, the team that set up Kubernetes yeah. for your infrastructure would say, you know, we have some GPU-enabled nodes, and this, these are their labels. And that would, that's really all you'd need to know. Yeah. Oh, but you need a, do a Docker runtime with all the CUDA binaries. You need, you need your CUDA yeah. runtime for it. Yeah. Yeah, 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 it would be in your images. It, it doesn't okay. necessarily need to be the Docker runtime. It could be Cryo or Podman or, you know, <laughs> Okay, you know. thanks. Tooling to make that easier would be a really nice enhancement for the project. If you feel like filing an issue, we, we can look at it. So, all right, well, thank you again. And in the next talk is going to be in 10 minutes. So.